Hi, it's Keith and Low Bates here, and today I'm going to bite the bullet and record a video on decentralized finance or DeFi. And it's a complicated topic, so the video is probably going to be quite long, but let's see if I can do it in one take. And I have to start off with a caveat or a warning, um, namely that DeFi is difficult to understand and very subtle and unregulated. So before you invest in any DeFi tokens, you need to do your own research. Um, and I should disclose at this point that to the best of my knowledge, I do not own any DeFi tokens. Um, and I personally am steering clear of it until uh, it has stabilized a bit and um, I can actually get a real sense of what is going on. However, it is fascinating and therefore well worth studying. Um, it's so complicated that I've actually got a list here with notes so I can structure the video accordingly and not accidentally skip any parts. Um, and we have to begin with a history lesson, uh, in particular looking at the concept of underlying assets. So in the finance world there's this concept of an underlying asset and initially those things were very tangible so they might be frozen orange juice or pork bellies um, then other underlying assets could include things such as gold now we're already going into an abstraction there because whereas the value of a glass of orange juice is very clear people across america drink it for breakfast every morning so there's a demand for it uh, gold is a fundamentally a store of value so it's already an abstraction from tangible things such as orange juice and pork bellies, even though gold is itself a physical thing. So you see, we're already moving into an abstraction. Now, the finance world created all sorts of financial instruments to um, allow the trading of these underlying assets to be done more easily and to provide services such as insurance. Um, derivatives is the name given to these things and uh, they are more flexible and easy to trade carrying around bars of gold or crates of oranges is a bit awkward however if you have an exchange then and you've kind of virtualized these um, underlying assets then uh, you can trade them more easily and what's the next note uh, so derivatives I, these instruments that are derived from the underlying assets are often traded in a decoupled manner from the original assets. So people who are buying and selling futures in the uh, frozen orange juice market might not actually drink orange juice themselves. They might not care about oranges in the slightest. They're just looking to make profits in the markets. Um, so again, another abstraction, you've created a financial instrument in order to allow farmers to offset risk of price fluctuations for their crops, but now people are trading them as though they are entities in themselves and they're not actually concerned about the underlying asset other than the fact that it's there supposedly backing up the whole system. Um, and in the good old days, the traditional financial instruments were good enough. Uh, you know, it was a, a step forward from having to take a risk as a farmer on uh, crop prices dropping in the market to actually being able to buy insurance. And uh, the traders um, were happy trading on the uh, trading floor and everything was running well and the system uh, was familiar to everybody. But uh, we've kind of come to expect in the computer and internet age that things should be able to be done a lot more efficiently. Um, and the problems in the current market systems is that there's high commissions, um, there are membership requirements in order to be able to trade on a trading floor, uh, you can't trade anonymously or if you do try to you have to use all sorts of nefarious schemes or shell companies or stuff like that in order to get away with it um, and markets have opening and closing times. Um, you know, we nowadays we expect to be able to do stuff 24-7 and yes, there is aftermarket trading, but there's still structure in the uh, market prices uh, very clearly from the fact that there is an opening bell and a closing bell. Um, so that's kind of the hist potted history of the background and you can see we're already at four and a half minutes. It's not going to be a short one. Um, now we move over into the crypto world. Now initially when things such as Bitcoin and then Ether came along, uh, they were seen as an oddity or just a computer, um, an interesting computery thing. Um, they didn't have much credibility or respectability. But uh, as time has gone on, these virtual assets have actually gained some sense of 
um, credibility and they have in a sense become an underlying asset for the crypto world. Now again you can see we have an abstraction on top of an abstraction on top of an abstraction. We have tangible goods such as oranges, we have a dollar value which is an abstraction from the tangible goods, we have derivatives in the terms of uh, futures and options um, and even options on futures so we're abstracting there. Now we're moving into the crypto space which is a virtualization of a representation of money so more abstraction and yet I'm saying here that a hypothesis is that these abstractions of abstractions of abstractions are now familiar enough and credible enough that they can actually form an underlying asset. Now the thing about having an underlying asset is that most people want to be able to profit from it. It's a form of capital and you don't just want to sit on it. Um, you want it to work for you. If you have capital, um, you don't take your million dollars, put it in a suitcase and shove it under your bed. You want it to go to work for you. And the same is happening in the crypto space. Now, in the old days, and when I say old, we're talking about four or five years ago, a person holding a lot of crypto really only had two options. Either they hodled, they just sat on it and waited for the dollar price to appreciate, or they could be a bit more dynamic and they could trade, although of course that comes with risk. But there's also the possibility of further rewards, of ratcheting up your holdings. Um, and uh, for quite a while, that's pretty much what you could do. Um, that sort of compares to either buying stocks in a company and then waiting for the company to uh, become more and more profitable and more and more valuable and therefore the stocks to appreciate in value or to actually trade the stocks, look for the highs and lows on a daily or weekly or monthly basis and try and increase your holdings that way. Um, however, there are now other options and when it comes to crypto, the clear option is the option of or the choice of lending it out. Um, people are always looking to borrow in order to fund a venture um, some people would want to borrow uh, based on their crypto holdings in order to avoid taxable events. Uh, other people might want to borrow in order to trade on margin. That is, they're borrowing money to make trades and ratchet, leverage up their um, uh, profits accordingly. So there are a number of different motivations to lend, uh, to borrow, and therefore there's a market for lenders. And lenders can charge interest when they lend their capital out. That's kind of how lending works. Um, now, the traditional banking system is a bit cumbersome in that in order to get a loan uh, you need to consult with banking representatives, uh, with your accountants or an auditor in order to determine that you have enough collateral to justify being someone who um, can borrow. Uh, you may need a lawyer, so all those people need to be paid and that's going to be factored in to the interest that is charged on you borrowing in the traditional financial system and borrowing in fiat. Um, and similarly, uh, it's not going to be very efficient. It's going to take a while to gain a loan. And if you do want to borrow, say, a small amount, um, then you're going to char uh, be charged a high premium, a high, high interest rate. Look at things like payday loans. They have eye-watering interest rates um, because the risks are higher and because there's a lot more effort involved and that effort needs to be paid for. Um, so, uh, what's the next bit? Um, so, we've gone through people borrowing for various reasons. So, if we look at what smart contracts in the blockchain ecosystems provide, well, um, they are decentralized, so you're not having to pay an overhead to a central authority like a bank. Um, they can uh, handle things anonymously, which uh, some people will find appealing. Maybe some of them are criminals, but a lot of them are also just ordinary people who want to go about their lives without everything being scrutinized. Um, they're open 24-7, so that beats stock markets or banks as well. Um, and they are deterministic. It's not like you turn up and try to uh, launch a smart contract or submit funds into a smart contract and you get rejected because the bank representative doesn't like your face or um, because um, that particular month they're being harsh on who they will allow to borrow uh, money off them. So uh, these are all advantages that a decentralized system has over the current centralized systems. Um, and uh, smart contracts can be used to enable cryptocurrency lending. So you can build 
decentralized systems through a network of smart contracts or one smart contract that actually enables the lending and I'll talk a bit later about what the mechanism is behind these lending systems but for now you can assume that there are systems out there they are decentralized um, they're governed through um, normally governance tokens uh, which allow people who hold those tokens to vote on how the lending system is setting its various parameters in terms of what collateral has to be provided and um, how much in comparison to the amount that's lent, uh, what kind of um, time spans lending occurs over, stuff like that, and adjusting things depending on how loans are being taken out and then repaid. Um, now, assuming that you have this uh, lending system in place, there is now another layer of abstraction that can come in, and this is currently being described as yield farming. Now, because you have a number of different decentralized lending platforms with different parameters and different return rates, as somebody who's holding an underlying crypto asset such as Bitcoin or uh, Ether uh, or some other token that has a value ascribed to it, um, you have to make a decision which of these lending platforms are you going to invest in. And this is where yield farmers come in. They are another layer on top of the system which monitors all these different lending platforms and decides on possibly even a second to second basis which one is giving the best returns and then automatically allocates your funds to that and moves them around for you so you don't have to worry about it. So that's yield farming in a nutshell. Now those of you who ever joined in on a dynamic mining pool for cryptocurrency should now understand that because they use the same thing except it's not cryptocurrency capital that's being invested in the mining pool, it's your hash power and the mining pools typically monitor which uh, cryptocurrency chains uh, are giving the best reward rate for the hash power expended on it and will switch dynamically from mining one cryptocurrency to another on a minute by minute basis possibly um, in order to maximize cryptocurrency mining returns. Now yield farming systems are exactly the same but instead of it being hash power that's allocated to uh, mining a cryptocurrency it's cryptocurrency that's being allocated to one of a number of lending platforms. So um, that's yield farming covered. Um, let's go back to the lending platforms. So the most common method used for a lending platform is that you have a volatile uh, cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin or Ether um, and there's a mechanism in the smart contract that will lock up that uh, cryptocurrency so it can no longer be spent. It's, it's basically been put in a safe and locked um, and then the a lending platform issues what's known as a stable coin in relation to your um, locked up traditional cryptocurrency. So you, you may lock up a hundred bitcoins and you may get a hundred uh, stable coins and they'll have a token name but I'm not going to name them because then people might go off and start investing in that particular platform thinking that I'm advising them to and I'm trying to avoid giving advice. Um, and the key there is that the stable coin has a fixed price in relation to another asset and the idea here is that you can decouple the cryptocurrency, um, not decouple the cryptocurrency, basically one of the problems you have with cryptocurrencies is they're strongly correlated so if one cryptocurrency goes up generally all the other ones go up too and similarly if one goes down all the other ones go down so how can you hedge that risk? And that's where stable coins come in. They're pegged to another kind of asset. It might be a fiat currency like the dollar or it might be gold. And the idea is that there is a uh, custodian holding the equivalent amount of gold or the equivalent amount of US dollars and that the stable coins are minted in proportion to the amount of the backing asset that is being held. And therefore they are stable relative to that um, asset that's being held. And um, the asset should be picked in such a way that it doesn't correlate to cryptocurrencies. And then you have that stable coin, you can then sell it for fiat, you can then use that um, effectively loan that's been given against your um, traditional cryptocurrency to fund a business or I don't know, buy a yacht without having to pay tax on selling your uh, bitcoins or stuff like that. And then eventually you'll earn back enough fiat with your business or um, with your work or whatever in order to buy back the equivalent amount of stablecoin to then use that stablecoin to unlock your original crypto asset. Um, so that's the principle behind it anyway. 
Um, so that's the whole DeFi infrastructure as far as I understand it at the moment. Um, and uh, it does seem to be really buzzing at the moment. But now I think it's time to talk about risks. And I have a whole bunch of them written down here. So the first and most off obvious risk is that these things are all managed through smart contracts and we've discovered time and time again that writing a good safe solid uh, smart contract is very very hard we've had cases where bugs in the code have locked up um, those assets permanently so you've lent your 100 bitcoins to a particular lending platform and then um, uh, there's a bug and it freezes all the assets and they can never be unlocked and uh, oops they're effectively gone. Other bugs have uh, been uncovered in various platforms where, which have allowed people to just siphon off funds. So that's like the bank being robbed, basically. Um, there's uh, been cases where the governance tokens that allow people, the, the collective group of people who are invested in um, the lending platform to set these parameters about, you know, how much of an asset needs to be staked in order to get so much stable coin and, st and such. Um, there have been cases where those governance uh, tokens have been hijacked and uh, control has been lost by the originators of the system over the lending platform with all sorts of disastrous consequences. Um, there are also problems with the stable coin mechanism in that uh, if there's um, some lying going on, uh, the people behind the platform could mint more stable coins than they have um, underlying asset backing them and then if that comes out then the whole thing collapses the value of the stable coin crashes um, and uh, the system grinds to a halt so there's a risk there too and that's why we have regulation in traditional finance to make sure that there's scrutiny over how the financial mechanisms are run and to allow for redress in case there's some injustice however I have to say that even in the traditional financial world, we still see plenty of scandals of manipulation of exchanges, insider trading, um, even with modern accountancy methods, there's still fraud. Um, and even with anti-money laundering and know your customer uh, uh, requirements, we still see money laundering. Um, so uh, the traditional system has shown that it's not flawless. And um, unfortunately, the decentralized system suffers from a whole range of different flaws. However, we've been pegging away at, uh, not pegging away, hacking away at fixing the traditional system, and yet um, there are still many, many problems, and there are many, many disadvantaged people who do not benefit from the existing systems. At least with DeFi, there is the possibility that at some point in the future, um, these issues will be solved, and it may actually be a much better way of managing all these financial instruments. Um, anyway, so there you go. I just chucked a bit of opinion in at the end. Now this video has nearly come in at 20 minutes, which I think shows why the topic is very complicated. However, I do hope that it's helped give you an understanding of what decentralized finance is about. And uh, I'll see you in the next video soon. Bye for now.